Um, so tonight we're going to discuss the, the roommate law, and um, it's, uh, it's got a few components. I'm going to give you an introduction, um, go through a couple of elements that I think are important, uh, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Ron and uh, Jack for uh, more specific applications on their experience in terms of particular cases and issues. Um, at the end, I'll highlight some of the issues that I, at the end of my presentation, um, but I'll give you some background that will, I think, hopefully provide a framework for what is going to follow. Um, so, you know, we have two happy roommates, so I thought I'd, that's hopefully where we're at, and uh, you can go to the next slide. So, this is, this is what we, uh, what we're concerned about, right? I mean, we're concerned about one roommate, but we're certainly concerned about the multiple roommates. Um, and that actually was some type of thing for the hazards of alcohol, but I thought it fit in pretty well here. So we can do the next slide, just a little. Uh... Okay, so I think the starting point, which is um, probably all too often slightly overlooked uh, in our discussions, is the actual statute. And because you're all pretty, uh, um, knowledgeable of co-op law, but maybe not the roommate law, I thought it would be worth it just to go through it. I think that's what your really, your framework is for all the cases and all of your decisions associated with the roommate law. And it's actually uh, not too complicated. The first section here basically defines a tenant. Um, and I will say, let, let me back up one second. I know we have, is anybody here from uh, the condo side of things? Okay. No, all co-ops, right? Which is good because it doesn't have a whole lot of impact directly on condos. Um, but basically, this is your, your definition of tenant. It's going to cover, um, and the cases say that it does cover um, tenants in cooperatives. So basically, anybody who's occupying a rental premises and is a party to the lease or rental agreement, and they say, or is a statutory tenant, not an issue for, for us, but it means that if you're you're there under the uh, rent stabilization law, it's still gonna uh, cover you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, occupant defines occupant, which is somebody other than a tenant. Uh, what's interesting is other than a tenant or a member of tenant's immediate family. Um, and here's where you get to number two, where you get to the meat of it. Uh, it shall be unlawful for a landlord to restrict occupancy of a residential premises by express lease terms or otherwise to a tenant or tenants, or to such tenants and immediate family, any such restriction in a lease or rental agreement entered into or renewed before or after the effective date of the section shall be unenforceable. So that's what's saying that that section to the extent, and you have to read it with the next section too, um, any lease or rental agreement for residential premises entered into by one tenant shall be construed to permit occupancy by the tenant, immediate family of the tenant, one additional occupant, and dependent children of the occupant, provided that the tenant or tenant spouse occupies the premises as his primary residence. So, what that says to us is, in essence, that if you are a tenant, you are entitled to have a roommate, and that roommate is entitled to reside there with that roommate's dependent children. Um, so that's pretty much it right there in a nutshell. Uh, basically, you're talking about However, and we'll come back to this later, one, one roommate. So um, those, that section three is really the, the heart of the roommate law. And that's what's you know, going to be driving your aggravation when um, you interview somebody and they tell you that they're going to live there in, uh, in the apartment and fill out an application and so on and so forth. And four months later, or four days later, hopefully not, they have a roommate. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and this is, you know, again, more of number four deals with multiple tenants. Number five, I think, is a little more interesting because it says the tenant shall inform the landlord of the name of any occupant within 30 days following the commencement of occupancy um, by such person or within 30 days following request by the landlord. So. <coughs> Uh, they're supposed to let you know within 30 days, and then it says, or within 30 days following request. So you have a right, one of the questions that comes up is, we want to know who's living there, right? You don't want to just have people in and out, you don't know who they are. Um, and so the statute does say, 
that um, you're entitled to landlord, which is a co -op cooperative, is entitled to know who's living there. So you do have that right. Um, enforcement is a separate issue. Um, no occupant or occupant's dependent child shall, without express written permission of landlord, acquire any right to continued occupancy in the event the tenant vacates the premises or acquire any other rights of tenancy. So basically what we're saying there is, if, you're, if, if the, the state is telling us that if they're a roommate, the roommate is only a roommate. Once the tenant vacates, they're not allowed to, they're not no longer a roommate. That's the essence of that. And there are some cases that deal with this, which we'll go over, I'm sure, will be addressed. Okay, we're good for the next. And you can't, you know, any provision number seven, you don't have this mostly in your proprietary leases, but basically you can't tell the tenant you have to waive the roommate law. You can't, you know, you can't have them sign something in closing saying they're waiving the roommate law. If you have them sign something saying they're waiving the roommate law as part of your closing documents or your application process or anything like that, uh, the court is not going to, it's not, it's going to be meaningless. So save the paper and, and, and don't bother, I would say. Um, okay, we can hit the next slide. So this basically talks about um, if there's a violation. So in essence, if you try and throw out a roommate, uh, presumably the tenant and the roommate can go to court and try and stop you from doing that by a separate type of action. Um, this is one of the um, important cases, uh, Roxborough Apartments versus Becker. And on this, the issue was, um, the, the issue has to do with the, whether the landlord can evict somebody um, uh, for violating the roommate law, i.e. having um, you know, more than one roommate, uh, based on the provisions of the law. So, so if it's not in the lease, saying you can only have these people, can you then use, can the landlord basically use the law to get somebody out as a second roommate? And what they're saying is, yes, you should have the language in the lease. You all, most, almost all proprietary leases have the language that you want, so you're generally gonna be protected, but it has to be in the lease. So your lease, this is a kind of a long-winded way of saying that your lease still matters. The language in your lease still matters, and, and as Ron and Jack are going to explain, those, those provisions in your lease are still what give you um, the ability to take appropriate action if somebody's violating not only their lease, but also the roommate law. Okay, we could do the next uh, slide. Okay, and this is similar. In this case, what's interesting here is, just to note, a side note, in New York City, they have what's called the multiple dwelling law. And a lot of these cases deal with the multiple dwelling law. We don't have to worry about that here in Westchester. We don't have the multiple dwelling law. But again, only one occupant in the subject apartment. So the lawful tenant and one roommate, not you know the, the party roommates that I had on the first slide. Um, let's see. So you know the, the the nutshell of this is that there are limitations even with the roommate law um, that apply. So next slide. Okay, area. These are areas that I think are generally of concern. I'm going to uh, just run down them, and I think uh, Ron and Jack will probably hit on them in greater detail. Um, general uh, issue that you're concerned about is the fact that roommates are more similar to tenants. They don't have an ownership interest. They likely may not be as concerned about their neighbors. They may not be as concerned about the building and how well they take care of it. So that's a philosophical problem for co-ops with the roommate law. Um, again, they're not vetted. You don't get to interview them. You don't get to the opportunity necessarily to advise them on house rules and policies. So you're not necessarily getting somebody who's aware of what uh, the proper behavior um, in a building uh, or in a cooperative. Uh, one we just talked about, numerous roommates. Now the law does give you the ability to address that. So that's that, although somebody's allowed to have one roommate now, obviously there are a lot of different permutations because you have a roommate and then the roommate has a daughter or the roommate has a son and you know, it gets complicated. Um, generally immediate family is okay, um, but uh, you know, 
that then you get into obviously verifying who's who in the apartment, right? Because everybody's got a brother, everybody's got a son or a father or daughter. But you're, you're, you would ultimately be entitled to limit the occupancy to you know, the, the tenant and the occupant and their immediate family. Um, original occupant, I should, I should have said original tenant, temporarily absent. So this is a scenario where they get a roommate and then you know, a short time after that, you're suddenly not seeing the shareholder or tenant there anymore. You're just only seeing the roommate. And they say, well, I still live there, you know, I'm just traveling for work, uh, you know, for seven days out of the week, uh, whatever it is. So, you know, the tenant, the tenant has to be there. Um, you know, there are proof issues. You have to be able to prove it. So what do you do? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things you can do, but all of them are, some, many of them are time consuming, some of them are costly, and they're all aggravating. Um, we've got used private investigators. Uh, we have clients with video in their buildings, so you can see who's going in and out, and by, by the same argument, who's not going in and out. Um, key fobs to get in and out of the building. So what's great about the key fob is, first of all, you can't really duplicate it, so they can't just give somebody a key. They kind of have to de facto come to you and say, I need another one, and why, and you turn off the old one. So the key fob system can be very uh, a very practical solution to monitoring who's coming in and out of the building. We've had clients with a key fob and a video, so we can see when the key fob was used, who used it, you know, and, and, and match up to the video. So there are, these tools are the problem with them, of course, is you have to have them and they cost money and everything else. But when you have them, you can monitor, yes, here's your one roommate's key and, and that's it. And if you suspect that somebody else is using the key, it's easily, relatively easily verifiable. And we had one case where we claimed that there was actually a sublet, not even a roommate, and they denied it. And I, we showed them the video for however many weeks and months that somebody else was using the key fob and you know, the case got resolved. So, um, roommate of an approved subtenant. Okay, so the question there, similar to the original occupant being temporarily absent, where suddenly um, you may have approved a sublet, maybe have a limited subletting policy, and then the sub subtenant uh, decides they want to get a roommate. And there's at least one case that indicates that the subtenancy uh, subtenant doesn't doesn't have a right to a roommate under the roommate law because the subtenant is not the tenant. Now that's only one case I found, but uh, you know it was something to think about if that happens. Um, lack of notice again. That was just a general concept of you don't know who's coming in and out. You don't necessarily know, and this can be an ongoing problem and frustration. You want to know who's in your building. And then the last one, which Ron and, and Jack will talk more about, just generally, is the uh, I, the Airbnb problem. So that's kind of a, a, a burgeoning one. It's more prevalent even in condominiums, but um, certainly it can be a problem for you. And there's two variations on that, right? One is if it's a roommate, and the other if the person isn't even there. So that's a problem that we're seeing more and more, and we, we try to deal with it by some of the practical mechanisms that I mentioned, as well as um, legal action when necessary. Uh, so we can hit the next slide. And, yeah, that's uh, if you're successful, you get to do that. Every day. So I'll turn it over to Ron and Jack, and uh, then we'll have questions in a little while. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Carl. And I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Walker Condominium Advisory Council, the BRI, for inviting me again. Uh, my musketeers, Carl and Jack, we did here once before for the smoking. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk about the roommate law. So um, it's going to be short and sweet because you have your proprietary lease here. This is the roommate law. Here's your proprietary lease. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Paragraph 14, most important, or one of the most important paragraphs talks about the use of the premises, who can be there, who can't be there. If we used to fight about the lessee and the lessee spouse, members of their immediate family, domestic employee, 
can all occupy the premises, but no more than two married couples. Excuse me, did I do this yet? Uh, that is no longer applicable because the roommate law has now eviscerated, superseded, supplemented it. That is now applicable. So you may have a pedophile living next to you who is also a chain smoker that you would never have approved, who is living there rightfully or wrongfully as a roommate, as somebody's spouse, can't stop that. Um, so there are problems. So from a little Q&A, your grandmother is a shareholder in an apartment. Her friend comes from California and stays with her for 10 days. That's a good, that's a good occupancy because it's a guest not more than 30 days. Grandmother has her friend stay there for two months. Violates your proprietary lease, but who's gonna get that friend out? Almost impossible. Even the fistful of fingers couldn't get that person out. So that, and I only mean that in the most humble way. So the next scenario, grandmother has a good friend there, she gets sick, she goes to the hospital for more than 30 days. What do we do then? Does any board have the gall to go after that person who's staying there or may even be a caregiver? Caregiver staying in the apartment. Person gets sick, they're rushed to the hospital. They stay there. In our right minds, can we go after that person for staying there? It all depends, is the shareholder gonna be permanently away or for how long? When does it become excessive and unreasonable? Okay, grandmother has a friend in the apartment. They're roommates. She says, oh, this is my roommate. Nothing we can do. But the grandmother is a snowbird. Bam, right out to Florida from November to April. What are we gonna do with that? I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting scenario. Do we go after that person? And what needs to be addressed is, if the roommate, let's assume it's a lawful roommate, the person must use the premises as their primary residence. That's what I think it says, that's what I think it means. What the hell is primary residence? There are many shareholders who have a home elsewhere. Doesn't mean you can't have multiple residences, but I surely would like to know where they are getting their star credit. I think that's an important issue, because if you have a shareholder living in an apartment building, I presume, hopefully they're making more than 500,000 and they're not eligible for STAR. But if they're living there and not getting STAR, either they're foolish, not knowledgeable, or they have another home that they are getting STAR on. And that might be an issue that you can potentially object and protest the improper occupancy. Now, let's talk about the roommate law. I've given you a uh, handout which has a lot of information, just not for me. My scenario is the roommate law, unintended consequences, the sublet subterfuge. Every case that I've had in the last four years involving improper occupancy subletting, either as a prosecuting the case or defending a case, I had one with Carl, in fact, was a roommate all along. <laughs> but everybody is a roommate. So what's the problem? How do we defeat it? What can we do? Or they say they're a member of our immediate family. So at the time of the application, or at the closing, the transfer agent needs to get the pedigree, everything, and probably a DNA test, just so that when we get that person who's there, he's really my brother, 
when you really come down to the cross-examination, oh, he's my brother from my divorced mother who's really dead and married an uncle. You know, the pedigree is not there. The pedigree, the holy trilogy, parents, grandparents, children, brothers, sisters, that's who's permitted there under paragraph 14, which is now meaningless. So if we look at the unintended consequences, the roommate law was designed, it was a public-minded, civic community aspect. Don't let the bad landlord, nothing to do with co-ops, evict the tenant where there's a restrictive or limited lease from having a roommate to help spread the cost of rent. That's what it was designed to do. What they failed to do when the legislature enacted that law, they did not exempt, either rightfully or wrongfully, inadvertently or intentionally, the word co-op. This law does not apply to a co-op. That's all they had to do and we'd be home free. We'd be, there wouldn't be any roommate issues. But they didn't do it. Courts came down and said, hey, co-ops, you are a proprietary lessee, you're the lessor, or therefore these tenants, your shareholders, are protected under the, under the roommate law. There is nothing we can do. The roommate law is really entitled, the unintent is really entitled, unlawful restrictions on occupancy. There's a copy in my handout here. Also in the handout is a great article by Richard Siegler from Strzok called The Roommate Law Revisited from the New York Law Journal. It's a great article, goes through many, many cases. The next article that I put in there is from Adam Light and Bailey, who is even more proud of his own work than I am, fine. Uh, he's a great litigator, he really knows what he's doing. And the roommate law, we talk about it. We've also put in the multiple dwelling law, which doesn't apply to us, but I wanted you to know, New York City put in a law that said, you may not rent for more than, for less than 30 days if you live in a Class A building. So I guess the defense is, well, I don't, I really live in a tenement, so it's, I can really do it. But the multiple dwelling law is put into effect to prevent and to protect the board with Airbnb. God, what a great idea. I don't even know how you catch people sometimes. They're there for a weekend. If you don't have a doorman or a concierge or a knowledgeable super, how do you catch them if it's in your building? Well, you go online. That's what the internet's for. Go online, see who's advertising in your building. It's all out there, you can go check. I just saw today, there's a building in Bronxville, Airbnb. So it, it, it's available, you can find out who is using their apartment for Airbnb. In New York City, they find that there's a stranger in the lobby who goes to the concierge and says, I don't have towels in the pool. Uh, how do I get them? And nobody's seen him, and he's an Airbnb guy. So what do we need to do with that? Uh, it's, I haven't had many problems, either one or two up, up here. I, guys, have you had many problems? with Airbnb as, as pervasive as it is in the city? It's not as pervasive as it is in the city, but the hotels are uh, that's not as <laughs> So, there are some issues there. Um, you'll see in my handout we talk about what should the co-op do, now that paragraph 14 is inapplicable, but the roommate law is not designed to evade, avoid, circumvent, the subletting policy or sublet provision at paragraph 15. Although it surely is the subterfuge, it's the vehicle used that every shareholder attempts to use to say, I am, I moved, excuse me, I changed my job, I'm traveling a lot. Carl must have read my, my hand out when he said that because you always hear the following. It's just a member of my media family it's a weekend guest. I changed jobs, traveling a lot. Oh, my cousin is house sitting. It's a roommate and I still live here. We have a case that's ongoing in one building 
where the husband and wife move to a, a house which is only in the husband's name. The wife has maintained the apartment in her name. She keeps her license. We never see her there. We will be litigating that. It is a problem. I think all the bills are still in her name. It's clearly a sublet. There's no doubt about it. And the board is beside themselves in trying to figure out what they can do to overcome this problem. So we need to control the improper occupancy, the unauthorized subletting. So what can we do to do that? I think first of all, you need, if you are a condominium, you need, you have certain provisions there to prevent uh, transient occupancies in your, uh, in, your, in your bylaws. You have the right, and I suggest that you put in fines you have enabling power probably to find people for transient uh, uh, rentals. You should implement that. There are certain ways that you can proceed if you are a condominium with seeking to get an injunction, get a temporary restraining order, but it's not gonna happen on the first time. You're gonna have to have a file in which you can document, whether it's a co-op or a condo, that somebody's conducting a business. It's not just a one-time or, or a minimal minimal uh, problem, that they're doing it on an ongoing basis, they're conducting a business, and you will need to document that. You will need to spend money with a private investigator, with a camera, security camera. Your best friend is your super. Your second best friend is the mailman. Your third best friend is the fob, or what I like to do if a building doesn't know who lives there, we put in a new key system. Everybody, you don't have to put a FOB system in. We're changing the front door key. 60 days, we're changing the front door key. Everybody come to the lobby, present your driver's license, and show us that you live here. It's a way to smoke them out a little bit. You can try to, pun intended. It's a way to figure out who, in fact, is living in your building. You do have a duty to provide a safe premise to provide a place where you are at least protected from strangers, from people who are roaming the halls, not just delivering uh, Chinese food or Italian food or something else, dropping off menus. You have the right to know who's living there and how can you implement measures to stop it. The same procedure with a co-op. If someone is subletting improperly or has a roommate that you think that that tenant that shareholder is no longer a primary resident. And we talked about primary residency. Carl and Jack, do you think he, that primary resident has to live there for 184 days? I don't think there's a case on that yet. But primary residency should be a term of art that if they, they can't just be there on weekends. Or can they? We travel for work. I can't be there. So the issue is, the shareholder must maintain the apartment as their primary resident. That's the key. If they're out for a temporary thing, such as a sabbatical, such as a medical problem, I don't think any court is gonna permit you to terminate the lease. If you bring them to court, the court is gonna permit them to cure. To cure. You're not gonna, you're not gonna evict to terminate that proprietary lease. In a long shot, you will get you will hopefully get your attorney's fees paid. You will hopefully get the court to, to, uh, to uh, wrap their wrists and say, the next time you build up on a pyramid, second or third time that they do it, you might be able to get them for objectionable conduct under paragraph 31 of your proprietary lease. So without any more fanfare, I'm going to turn the floor over to Jack. Jack will make a presentation, and thereafter we'll open the floor for questions. You can hear the three musketeers. Jack, it's all yours. Jack Malley, Smith, Buss, and Jacobs, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me back, despite my last performance. I really appreciate that you me back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, dispute uh, litigation issues concerning uh, roommate disputes, roommate questions. 
And what I'm going to do is just talk about it generally and then talk about a few actual cases and compare and contrast where the good job was done by the board and the managing agent and where the bad job was done. The first thing I would say is this is a really delicate issue. These disputes are very delicate and need to be handled very carefully because they're really personal. They're really personal to people, right? One of the primary issues is, is this tenant or leaseholder living in this place? Is this their primary residence? If you're in dispute, you're going to be investigating whether this person has been sleeping there, how much time they're spending there. People don't like that. If it was me, I wouldn't like that, right? You're going to have questions of who's a family? Because people who are a family can live there, right, under the roommate law. There's a lot of, lot of uh, different definitions of what family is, so people can be highly offended if they're accused of not being a family member. And finally, you have this idea of an occupant, and there's relationships between the occupant and the tenant that can be unique. So if you're accusing somebody of not being having that relationship, that can be highly offensive. And sometimes what comes back is allegations and lawsuits, like discrimination and invasion of privacy and things like that. So before you even think about starting a lawsuit about a roommate, you know, trying to evict a roommate, all these things come into question, and they should be considered very carefully about the implications that could occur. So with that in mind, I'd just like to talk about a couple of actual disputes uh, the first one I found to be really, really interesting. It involves a very interesting woman. Her name is Lily, her name, I think Alicia's still alive, Lily Loge. <coughs> kind of had a uh, very elegant and charming life for a long time, kind of until this dispute hit her. She was the daughter of a guy named John Davis Loge, who was the one time a very famous actor back in the 30s and 40s. He, was, he starred with uh, Marlene Dietrich, uh, the co-star, uh, the leading man. He starred in a Shirley Temple movie, was her father. Then he became the governor of Connecticut and the ambassador to Spain. So that's who Lily Loge grew up with. That was her father. You know, while her father can only be described as a, as a stud, I guess, in contrast, unfortunately, her husband was a dud, a, 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 a big dud, a guy named James Marcus, who was also pretty well known. He was the water commissioner under the Lindsay administration in the 60s, and he got caught up in a big scandal. Uh, basically, he was taking kickbacks uh, from the mob and a whole big trial, and the guy got thrown in jail, and eventually, Lily and Mr. Marcus were divorced. In about 1986 or late 80s, she was left with no husband and no income and in a bad spot. So, what did she do? She decided to use her unit. She was in there for about 30 years at that point as a bed and breakfast. So what she did was she formed a corporation, she advertised, and for a period of 11 years, she had people coming into her two-bedroom apartment. They were renting a bedroom and use of the bathroom. And she would have a note at the door where the keys are, where to leave them, what time they have to leave. This was going on for 11 years. So it's safe to say this board and this building were not on top of things. Basically what happened was, she was, she was renting from a shareholder and the board figured out what was happening and they came down to the shareholder and the shareholder then sued uh, Lily. Uh, the shareholder sent a notice of termination and she didn't respond and then he tried to evict her. So, of course, you can, based on our topic, you can imagine what her defense was. These were roommates. These are my roommates. I had a lot of roommates over a long period of time. So the court, as you can expect, didn't buy that. They said a, a, uh, a, a occupant or a tenant uh, has to be for a period of time, a good significant period of time, not just a day or two. 
So the court knocked that out. But she had a couple of other good defenses, which I'm really surprised she lost on. One was, she said, this was open and notorious for 11 years. Where were you guys? You waived your right. I should be allowed to stay in here. Surprisingly, the court uh, denied that defense, which I, I really was surprised about that. Uh, the other one was statute of limitations defense she had. She said, again, this was going on since 1991, so you're too late. The court held that each time she was bringing in a guest, that was a new violation of law. So, Lily lost. But in the end, the lesson is, this is a board, a managing agent that wasn't doing their job. Uh, uh, similar, uh, consistent with what Ron said, actually, Lily ended up okay. She had a judgment against her, and uh, the judgment was stayed, and they reached a settlement, basically, where she could stay there. She had been there for 40 years at that point, and she just had to report every month as to who were, who were her guests or who, who was staying there with her. She got to stay there. She could be still alive today, I'm not sure. This is a 2002 case. So that's the wrong way. <laughs> The next uh, example is a, is a case where the managing agent uh, did a hell of a job in collecting evidence that allowed it to prevail. Uh, this is a building over in Yonkers, which I won't disclose, but in about 2012, uh, the managing agent noticed that it was, there was a shareholder who had, always, had registered in, one, one shareholder, one person in, in the uh, unit and that shareholder had registered one occupant. So that was on the books and that was okay. The managing agent noticed, uh, was on Craigslist, and noticed that the shareholder was looking to rent the place out. So they notified the uh, shareholder that, hey, we know you already have an occupant, so if you're gonna rent this out, it's gonna have to be a sublease and you're gonna need our approval. So that kind of uh, drew the managing agent's attention to the problem and they got right on it, and they did, I think, what Carl had talked about. They set up a video system, and they had a camera right outside this person's door for three months. And the managing agent, every day, viewed this and kept a log, a very detailed log. And basically what uh, was discovered was, this guy was there about once a month for, and he didn't even stay overnight. He, he'd come and he'd leave. So like under the roommate law, right, that occupant couldn't stay there because he was not residing, residing there. So what happened was the board then started fining, charging sublet fees to this uh, shareholder because it really was a sublet and they should have asked permission. And there was a dispute that went on for about a year or so. Eventually, uh, he, uh, he, the shareholder was going to apply for a sublet but the uh, board and the managing agent was going to require that before they could approve any sublease, sub he would have to pay all the prior fees, and he didn't do that. So finally, it was a notice to cure in late 2013. He didn't comply, and eventually what happened was he sold his unit. However, uh, the board wouldn't approve it until he paid off all those fees, the sublet fees and the attorney's fees. So the, the deal closed, and what happened he came back and he sued the co-op in Yonkers uh, City Court, saying he was overcharged. In other words, he, wa he wanted to void those sublet fees and get his money back. So there was actually a trial that could have happened previously in Supreme Court or anywhere else. His defense to shareholder was, they were discriminating against me. He was gay, he said the reason why they were coming after him was because, uh, because he was gay. However, the defense of the co-op was, well, he wasn't residing, and we got great evidence, and it was a whole trial, and they put the managing agent on, he had his log, testified at length, and the shareholder's whole claim was dismissed. So, contrast, Lily Loge's managing agent and board versus this board and managing agent in Congress. You have to be on top of things, you have to keep good records if you expect to prevail in litigation. I only have one more example, and this is a case where, this is, a, this is a apartment building, but where a landlord crazily overreached and really invaded, attempted to invade the privacy of a, of a man and a woman. What this was, there was a 
woman who had a lease, and during and when I, I think she had two renewals, and during this, the first renewal, a man moved in, and they got married. Then in the third renewal, it just stayed in her name. So she tried to get her husband added to that new lease, and the landlord wouldn't allow it. It ended up in a lawsuit, and the landlord took a crazy position. What they did was they tried to, there was a famous uh, case called Brasha versus Stahl Associates by the Court of Appeals, which that was the case that decided that a surviving domestic partner has rights to a tenant, as a tenant, if the domestic partner dies. And what that, what that uh, the rule of law that the Court of Appeals announced in that case was that if surviving domestic partner would have those rights if there was a dependent financial and emotional relationship, right? So what this landlord tried to accuse uh, this man and woman of, he did a lot of investigation, and he believed he found that the man was, uh, was gay, also did all sorts of investigation into his private life, his medical life, and he had HIV, and he tr they tried to challenge uh, this guy's right to be here as the husband by saying it was a sham marriage, it wasn't even real. So there'd be no right to do that. And they went forward with this thing, and, you know, really being aggressive and overreaching, and they got nailed big time. The judge came at them really hard, basically called it out for what it was, an invasion of privacy, and there's no way, they wanted discovery on their sex life. And, and the court rejected all that. The court fined and sanctioned the lawyer, and the gentleman was able to stay there for as long as he wanted. So that's a third example, a second example of a poor, well in that case of a, a landlord just acting ridiculous, going way over the top. So, my Jack, lesson, don't worry about that, our courts don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the final lesson is, uh, as in the second example, be detailed, watch what you're doing, keep good records if you expect to prevail in litigation. Otherwise, with a very sensitive topic like this, where people are very emotional, and they can come back to you with all sorts of, with all sorts of allegations of discrimination and things like that, you're going to lose. You'll be stuck in a litigation for two or three years and pay a hell of a lot of fees. The lawyers like to think you don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Carl, thank you. Ron, thank you. We do have time for questions. I'll pass around the mic. We'll start with Peg Conover, who's a member of the CCAC board. Do these laws apply to the sponsor? I happen to have a sponsor tenant who rents out the bedroom of a one bedroom apartment to transient people. And the sponsor ignores it when we notify the sponsor of it. Excuse me. <laughs> the sponsor has certain rights they can rent, they can sell without your consent, uh, whether or not they're permitted to have a transient uh, pop population for short periods of time. I, I don't I don't believe you're gonna get the attorney general or you're gonna get a court to change that. But a sponsor clearly has better rights than everybody else. They're designed in the plan, and that they have a right to rent and do that without your consent. But is your question, is your question um, not just that, but whether the sponsor uh, is bound by the roommate law for his tenant, or is your question? Well, it's actually like an Airbnb, renting out the bedroom of a one-bedroom apartment by the sponsor's legal tenant. Generally speaking, a sponsor, you're not you're gonna have a hard time restricting a sponsor. That's what Ron said. But does the roommate law apply to the sponsor's tenants? The sponsor tenants have the right to have roommates. That the law was permitted for that. Whether or not you could go after the sponsor or join together, you as a, you should be a team with the sponsor under that scenario to go after that tenant. Sponsor would love to get that tenant out. No, no, so, you know, no. Okay. No, 
Right. Yeah. He's, he's happy to have his tenant there, pay the rent, and do whatever he wants. It's a problem. Thank you. Okay. Jack Malley, Smith, Buss, and Jacobs, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me back. Despite my last performance, I really appreciate that you having me back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, dispute uh, litigation issues concerning uh, roommate disputes, roommate questions. And what I want to do is just talk about it generally and then talk about a few actual cases and compare and contrast where the good job was done by the board and the managing agent and where the bad job was done. The first thing I would say is this is a really delicate issue. These disputes are very delicate and need to be handled very carefully because they're really personal. They're really personal to people, right? One of the primary issues is is this tenant or leaseholder living in this place? Is this their primary residence? If you're in dispute, you're going to be investigating whether this person has been sleeping there, how much time they're spending there. People don't like that. If it was me, I wouldn't like that, right? You're going to have questions of who's a family? Because people who are a family can live there, right, under the roommate law. There's a lot of, lot of uh, different definitions of what family is, so people can be highly offended if they're accused of not being a family member. And finally, you have this idea of an occupant, and there's relationships between the occupant and the tenant that can be unique. So if you're accusing somebody of not being having that relationship, that can be highly offensive. And sometimes what comes back is allegations and lawsuits, like discrimination an invasion of privacy and things like that. So before you even think about starting a lawsuit about a roommate, you know, trying to evict a roommate, all these things come into question and they should be considered very carefully about the implications that could occur. So with that in mind, I'd just like to talk about a couple of actual disputes. Uh, the first one I found to be really, really interesting. It involves a very interesting woman. Her name is Lily, her name, I think, Alicia's she's still alive, Lily Loge. <coughs> kind of had a uh, very elegant and charming life for a long time, kind of until this dispute hit her. She was the daughter of a guy named John Davis Loge, who was the, one time, a very famous actor back in the 30s and 40s. He was, he starred with, uh, Marlene Dietrich, uh, the co-star, uh, the leading man. He starred in a Shirley Temple movie, was her father. Then he became the governor of Connecticut and the ambassador to Spain. So that's who Lily Loge grew up with. That was her father. You know, while her father can only be described as a, as a stud, I guess, in contrast, unfortunately, her husband was a dud. A, a, a big guy, a guy named James Marcus, who was also pretty well known. He was the water commissioner under the Lindsay administration in the 60s, and he got caught up in a big scandal. Uh, basically, he was taking kickbacks uh, from the mob, and a whole big trial, and the guy got thrown in jail. And eventually, Lily and Mr. Marcus were divorced, in about 1986 or late 80s, she was left with no husband and no income and in a bad spot. So, what did she do? She decided to use her unit, she was in there for about 30 years at that point, as a bed and breakfast. So what she did was she formed a corporation, she advertised, and for a period of 11 years, she had people coming into her two-bedroom apartment. They were renting a bedroom and use of the bathroom. And she would have a note at the door where the keys are, where to leave them, what time they have to leave. This was going on for 11 years. So it's safe to say this board and this building were not on top of things. Basically what happened was, she was, she was renting from a shareholder, and the board figured out what was happening, and they came down to the shareholder, 
and the shareholder then sued uh, Lilly. Uh, the shareholder sent a notice of termination, and she didn't respond, and then he tried to evict her. So, of course, you can, based on our topic, you can imagine what her defense was. These were roommates. These are my roommates. I had a lot of roommates over a long period of time. So the court, as you can expect, didn't buy that. They said a, a, uh, a, a occupant or a tenant uh, has to be for a period of time, a good significant period of time, not just a day or two. So the court knocked that out. But she had a couple of other good defenses, which I'm really surprised she lost on. One was, she said, this was open and notorious for 11 years. Where were you guys? You waived your right. I should be allowed to stay in here. Surprisingly, the court uh, denied that defense, which I, I really was surprised about that. Uh, the other one was statute of limitations defense she had. She said, again, this was going on since 1991, so you're too late. The court held that each time she was bringing in a guest, that was a new violation of law. So, Lily lost, but in the end, the lesson is, this is a board a managing agent that wasn't doing their job. A similar, uh, consistent with what Ron, what Ron said, actually, Lily ended up okay. She had a judgment against her, and uh, the judgment was stayed, and they reached a settlement, basically, where she could stay there. She had been there for 40 years at that point, and she just had to report every month as to who her who were her guests or who, who was staying in with her. You have to stay there. She could be still alive today, I'm not sure. This is a 2002 case. So that's the wrong way. The next uh, example is a, is a case where the managing agent uh, did a hell of a job in collecting evidence that allowed it to prevail. Uh, this is a building over in Yonkers, which I won't disclose. But in about 2012, uh, the managing agent noticed that it was, there was a shareholder who had, had registered in, it was one, one shareholder, one person in, in the uh, unit, and that shareholder had registered one occupant. So that was on the books and that was okay. The managing agent noticed, uh, was on Craigslist, and noticed that the shareholder was looking to rent the place out. So they notified the uh, shareholder that, hey, we know you already have an occupant, so if you're going to rent this out, it's going to have to be a sublease, and you're going to need our approval. So that kind of uh, drew the managing agent's attention to the problem, and they got right on it, and they did, I think, what Carl had talked about. They set up a video system, and they had a camera right outside this person's door for three months. And the managing agent, every day, viewed this and kept a log, a very detailed log. And basically what... Uh, was discovered was this guy was there about once a month for he didn't even stay overnight he, he'd come and he'd leave so like under the roommate law right that occupant couldn't stay there because he was not residing residing there so what happened was the board then started fining charging sublet fees to this uh, shareholder because it really was a sublet and they should have asked permission and there was a dispute that went on for about a year or so Eventually, uh, he, uh, he, the shareholder was going to apply for a sublet, but the uh, board and the managing agent was going to require that before they could approve any sublet, sublease, he would have to pay all the prior fees, and he didn't do that. So finally, there was a notice to cure in late 2013. He didn't comply, and eventually what happened was he sold his unit. However, uh, the board wouldn't approve it until he paid off all those fees, the sublet fees and the attorney's fees. So the, the deal closed and what happened, he came back and he sued the co-op in Yonkers uh, City Court saying he was overcharged. In other words, he, wa he wanted to void those sublet fees and get his money back. So there was actually a trial that could have happened previously in Supreme Court or anywhere else. His defense to shareholder was they were discriminating against me. He was gay, he said the reason why they were coming after him was because, of it, because he was gay. However, the defense of the co-op was, well, he wasn't residing there. And we got great evidence, and there was a whole trial, and they put the managing agent on, he had his log, testified at length, 
and the shareholder's whole claim was dismissed. So contrast Lily Loge's managing agent and board versus this board and managing agent in Congress. You have to be on top of things. You have to keep good records if you expect to prevail in litigation. I only have one more example, and this is a case where, this is, a, this is a apartment building, but where a landlord crazily overreached and really invaded, attempted to invade the privacy of a, of a man and a woman. What this was, there was a woman who had a lease, and during, and it went on, I think she had two renewals, and during this, the first renewal, a man moved in, and they got married. Then, in the third renewal, it just stayed in her name. So she tried to get her husband added to that new lease, and the landlord wouldn't allow it. It ended up in a lawsuit, and the landlord took a crazy position. What they did was they tried to, there was a famous uh, case called Brasha versus Stahl Associates by the Court of Appeals, which that was the case that decided that a surviving domestic partner has rights to a tenant, as a tenant, if the domestic partner dies. And what that, what that uh, the rule of law that the Court of Appeals announced in that case was that if surviving domestic partner would have those rights if there was a dependent financial and emotional relationship, right? So what this landlord tried to accuse uh, this man and woman of, he did a lot of investigation, and he believed he found that the man was, uh, was gay. Also, did all sorts of investigation into his private life, his medical life. And he had HIV, and he tr they tried to challenge uh, this guy's right to be here as the husband by saying it was a sham marriage. It wasn't even real. So there'd be no right to do that. And they went forward with this thing. You know, really being aggressive and overreaching, and they got nailed big time. The judge came at them really hard, basically called it out for what it was, an invasion of privacy, and there's no way, they wanted discovery on their sex life. And, and the court rejected all that. The court fined and sanctioned the lawyer, and the gentleman was able to stay there for as long as he wanted. So that's a third example, a second example of a court well, in that case, a, a, a landlord just acting ridiculous, going way over the top. So, my Jack, lesson, don't worry about that. Our courts don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the final lesson is, uh, as in the second example, be detailed, watch what you're doing, keep good records if you expect to prevail in litigation. Otherwise, with a very sensitive topic like this, where people are very emotional, and they can come back to you with all sorts, with all sorts of allegations of discrimination and things like that, you're going to lose, you'll be stuck in a litigation for two or three years and pay a hell of a lot of fees. The lawyers like fingers. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Carl, thank you. Ron, thank you. We do have time for questions. I'll pass around the mic. We'll start with Peg Conover, who's a member of the CCAC board. Do these laws apply to the sponsor? I happen to have a sponsor tenant who rents out the bedroom of a one bedroom apartment to transient people. And the sponsor ignores it when we notify the sponsor of it. Excuse me. <laughs> the sponsor has certain rights they can rent, they can sell without your consent. Uh, whether or not they're permitted to have a transient uh, pop population for short periods of time, I, I don't. I don't believe you're going to get the attorney general or you're going to get a court to change that. But a sponsor clearly has better rights than everybody else. They're designed in the plan, and that they have the right to rent and do that without your consent. But is your question? Is your question? Um not just that, but whether the sponsor uh, 
is bound by the roommate law for his tenant, or is your question? Well, it's actually like an Airbnb, renting out the bedroom of a one-bedroom apartment by the sponsor's legal tenant. You're generally speaking, a sponsor, you're not, you're going to have a hard time restricting a sponsor. That's what I said. But does the roommate law apply to the sponsor's tenants? The sponsor tenants have the right to have roommates. That, the law was permitted for that. Whether or not you could go after the sponsor or join together, you, as a, you should be a team with the sponsor under that scenario to go after that tenant. Sponsor would love to get that tenant out. No, no. Two so, minutes, you know, right. no. Okay. No, right. He's, he's happy to have his tenant there, pay the rent, and do whatever he wants. It's a problem. Thank you. Okay. Mary Milan. Um, our co-op doesn't allow sub subleases, first of all. But if somebody does come in as a single person and ends up marrying and the person is not on the stock certificate, we still ask for a meet and greet where we don't check financials, but just make sure they know the house rules. So we do have a very strange situation, kind of like what you were talking about. We have two brothers. Uh, who did not live together in the, in the beginning. The one brother, who is the shareholder, uh, actually works in a third world country and only comes back once every couple of years, pretty much. Um, his brother had started coming, saying he was picking up the mail, but staying, and we said this was a violation of our subletting laws. It was kind of going in the back door of subletting. The brother came back for about, the shareholder came back for about a week and said, I'm coming back, my brother wants to live with me, I want to do it right, let's have the meet and greet, which we did in good faith, because the shareholder was coming back, we let that happen. A week later, he went back to his job in the third world country, never to return again for another year. So now the question is, we have somebody who we have said, it's okay for you to be here, but can we renege on that now? Because that was under the assumption that the shareholder was going to be living there. I, two things. First of all, when you say that you... Um, Could you talk about this? Yeah, let me get the... Oh, there you go. Okay. When, when you say, um, a couple things, at least to, to my ear, when you say, when you're saying that you um, allowed him to live there, it sounds to me more like you um, gave him um, an interview uh, consistent with your policy um, for him to be a roommate of the original resident. Now, there is. Um, also, your language in your proprietary lease probably says words to the effect of shareholder and his or her immediate family. There's a split. In Westchester, that means and means and. In certain other counties in New York City, they've actually, the courts have interpreted and as or. But if, assuming you're in Westchester, you're basically okay with and means and. So the shareholder is still supposed to reside there. So assuming the shareholder is still supposed to reside there, whether it's under your proprietary lease or he doesn't get to have a roommate under the roommate law because he's not living there. It sounds like he's not living there. I, I, you know, there are always fact-specific cases. Is somebody living there or are they not living there? Okay? But if they're coming in for one day a year, I think you have some evidence that they are not living there. Oh, absolutely. But once we've interviewed and, and the brother, we can say it was under the impression that your brother was going to be living here. Now that he's turned around and gone back, I mean, it would be nice if you had some documentation to establish that in terms of if you put in a letter, I'm bringing my brother to be a roommate, I'll be living here, if he sent you something, or if you issued a letter um, after interviewing saying that, Thank you for being your brother. We understand he'll be your, as a roommate. Here's a copy of the house rules or whatever. Um, if there's some documentation, I think that would be nice. On the other hand, it, then it just becomes another factual issue, which is to say, and it may be in your board minutes, there may be some, some record of this, but depending on how good your records are and what you have in writing and everything else, your worst case scenario, I suppose, is it becomes a case of your testimony and the other members of the board as to what was said versus their testimony. Now, 
you probably also have some provisions in your proprietary lease which talk about no waiver and things of that nature. So you may be able to revoke your consent as well. That, that would be another thing. Um, but it's a little different than the idea that it was conditioned on something and if they're not meeting it, then they no longer have your consent versus actively saying you no longer have our consent. But you know, these are all things where somebody would have to sit down get into details of exactly what happened, who was there, when it happened, what evidence you have to back up what happened at that meeting, and then make a decision as to what you want to do in terms of giving them a notice to cure and then a notice to terminate. Is his occupancy a problem? Is he doing anything wrong? He's, well, he's actually causing some problems besides that, yes. Because if his occupancy was not a problem, you may, uh, you might let it go, especially getting process of service on the brother in this third world uh, place, I think you do have the right to revoke approval if that situation has changed. Well, the problem is more that the other shareholders feel that they came in the back door in a subletting, and there are other shareholders that want to sublet, and we've said no, and it kind of looks like he got in through so that. The interesting door. thing about subletting, many boards, subletting, many boards consider a sublet to be a person who is not a member of the fam family, of the family that's not, whereby if you, I can, can I buy an apartment for my grandparents and let them live there? And does that constitute a sublet if I'm not present? In New York City, clearly it's permitted because it's an or situation. Here, there are many boards that say, you know what, it's okay. We'll let you buy an apartment for your parents or the parents buy an apartment for their kids. And sometimes they even put everybody on the lease even though they know that people aren't going to be living there, but it's just for the, the person to guarantor and that the child's living there. Um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with those situations being totally different than an, un, uh, than an unrelated sublet. Uh, but that, that should be a policy that the board adopts, yeah. obviously, and I think in your case the board has not adopted that policy, so that would be something you could discuss as a board. If Is you it want really being other? Is it really, I'm is it really his brother? Well, I, I'm assuming from the question that it's really his brother. But it, 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 right, if it's not really his brother, that's a whole other issue. I mean, yeah, that's, hold on, hold on, let's get the... the question from Jai Sani. Hi, and then you're next. Uh, I, the way I understand is the underlying issue is whether, what is the primary residence of this tenant? Uh, if this person is uh, has a job outside, and if he is paying U.S. taxes, which he has to, what is his primary residence on his tax returns? Well, it's not only your tax return, though. Yes, tax return is one factor. Driver's license is another factor. Voting record is another factor. I've had, seen a case where you know, the driver's license is is at the apartment, the tax returns apartment. They've applied for a star exemption at another bill at another house. So they've established, even though some of the documentation showed one thing, we had evidence of a primary residence somewhere else. Then we also, you know, I've had cases where we've gotten a private investigator. So yeah, they keep all their documents in order, but the investigator follows them and we figure out that they have another address. Maybe they're, maybe they're the roommate to somebody else. So they're, they're, it's not just one, there's not one decisive piece of information or documentation that establishes whether the apartment, whether the co-op is their primary residence or whether something else is their primary residence. But in this context, this person is, uh, has owned this building and he's working outside. I think there is no reason to believe that he doesn't have a driver license for that address or, you know, and you have he doesn't have an intent to come back. You know, they, the primary oh, no. residence goes by, the, I mean, the way I understand it, the primary residence is determined by the intent. Your intent to occupy it. No, you, may not, you may not do it now, but you still have an intent. And depending upon your contact with the uh, uh, stay where you are residing currently. So if you are holding a job outside and you he, have intent to you can I, come I back. would not say that intention is the determining factor either. Obviously it's a factor. Uh, you know, you may not know until you get to court and a judge decides in some of these cases. I mean, what I find to be compelling, what you find may be different than what you find, maybe different than what Ron and Jack find to be compelling, 
And we have cases that we try to find, when you go to court, what we all do as attorneys is try and find some of the cases, like the ones I showed you and Jack mentioned, that are similar, and that have good findings on behalf of the cooperative and present them to the court and say these facts are similar to this case and therefore you should you know, give us a warrant of eviction because it's, a, it, it's not a roommate, it doesn't qualify, it's a sublet, etc. But a lot of times it's, you know, it's difficult to find a case that's exactly the same as your particular case. So you're, you're working by analogy. So I think there, from what you're saying, it sounds like there are some very good points in favor of your taking a pro what the board would deem as an appropriate action. But I think someone would have to really sit down and outline it. And then you'd have to decide, based on the philosophical perspective, which is we don't allow subletting or we have a limited number of sublets. You know, if you think you have a limited number of sublets and this is taking one up where it's pushing you over your number, there's all kinds of considerations that you all um, give to subletting and whether to allow it and how many sublets to allow, if you allow any terms, it's, it's sometimes limited to two years or one year or three years as a waiting list. So these are all things that you would think about as you decide what actions to take when these things when these things occur. One of, one of the issues with subletting is that many boards, when they apply for their underlying mortgage or when, will not count that a member of the immediate family living in an apartment as a sublet. They won't count that, they won't put it in there, they'll just say that's a primary resident, it's owner occupied, period. That's how they count that, many times. We have time for uh, a few more questions. This gentleman had a question, and then we'll go to Gene DeResta, and then we'll go to Kathy, and then we have to call it off. So we'll be close to 9 o'clock by now. Yeah, Carl, does this mean that you can't do a background check on someone that wants to? Uh, That's a problem. On the roommate? That's a problem. It's not a problem, problem or is you it can't it? stop them. You, you can't. It's a problem in that if they don't submit to it, you don't have a lot of options for requiring it. Uh, number two, as you know, I believe you authored it. Our uh, occupancy agreement states you only allow a certain number of people in a one-bedroom apartment, and a certain number of number in a two-bedroom, etc. Uh, how does that rip it up? <laughs> well, it's it, 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 you know, with with the number of occupants, there's a couple of problems. Yeah, I mean, it says it's not just the roommate law, but there are some cases that say the person moves in. Boyfriend was in. They maybe the boyfriend has a child somewhere else, or they have a child together. They have more children, and then suddenly you have more people. Maybe you have five people or whatever, and some of them are kids and whatever. And there are some cases that say that you, based on family changes in family composition like that, you can't um, evict somebody. So. Those are difficult situations. Overcrowding, I think, is what, eight square feet? The, the new amount for overcrowding in the state building code is whatever the number is, you can squeeze far more people in there than you would have thought. If you think it. that it's overcrowding, it is not. <laughs> I believe that there is uh, is eight square feet per person. Eight, uh, eight, eight square feet. That's what I believe. I, I don't I remember the number. It, it may not be. It, it, it's more than you think. I mean, there's no question. It's a certain number to start with per bedroom and then a certain number per square foot or something like that. I mean, it, it tends to be very difficult to get people out on overcrowding. Unless there's a violation, the city files a violation for overcrowding, and then you maybe have that they broke the lease because they allowed a violation to come, but then, you know, who wants that? You know, you don't want a violation. So that tends to be a, that's a difficult one. It's very hard to get the city to come in to file an overcrowding one on that one. They will come in with an SRO, single room occupancy, where everybody has a, 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 lock a lock on their own doors to show that it's it's clearly not a not an apartment, but it's somebody's renting out each room. Uh, that that they may come in. So. Of course, then the people just move the locks. And, uh, we have time for two more questions. Gene DeResta, followed by Kathy Graham. Gene. Thank you. Question one. These are quick questions. Is everything you described and discussed tonight applicable to a residential apartment building? Yes. So the same rules apply? Okay. Yes. Assuming leases and yes. I see. Okay, the second question then relates to does the landlord have the right to require <coughs> the individual to provide proof that they are indeed a family member? 
Well, they don't have to be a family. They don't have to be. The key here is they don't have to be a family member. You have to say it's a roommate. That's it. That's the problem. We'd be less aggrieved if it had to be a family member, but maybe not totally less aggrieved. <laughs> Our final question comes from Kathleen Jensen Graham, who is a member of the CCAC board. And Doria, I apologize, I didn't mean to go for you. Okay. I have a question about a situation we have, the story of Bob and Carol. Ted and Allison Bay. <laughs> so, What's the address, please? <laughs> so Bob bought a very small studio apartment in 2007. In 2009, he claimed to have married Carol, who moved in to this tiny space with him. In 2013, Bob retired and bought a house down in Broward County. We haven't seen him since. However, Carol remained. And right after Bob left, in came Ted, <laughs> who spent, with New Jersey's plate, spends almost every night there. And then, in the summertime, Alice and Betty, Ted's kids, are there. So now we have four of them in virtually a closet. I had written to Bob in Broward County, and he did, he complied. I sent a registered letter to the address in Broward County. He complied and had had Carol sent a copy of their marriage license. Of course, there could have been a subsequent divorce, if not. I hope there's another Alice in Florida, but do we have any rights here? Well, excuse me, let me, uh, <laughs> let me, maybe, but. Well, the question, first of all, that goes back at least maybe partly to the and um, issue. Um, they don't collect star you, in the department. They do not collect star in the department. Never did. You, they you might have. Uh, what you're describing, what somebody else mentioned in terms of the numbers, it sounds like four people. I mean, again, even saying that you can get, well, we have four or five people in a small apartment, you might be close to the overcrowding. You'd have to get the actual square footage and look at the state, somebody would have to look at the state building code. I didn't look at that, you know, for this evening. Um, and uh, so, with, in terms of the roommate law, um, he's supposed to be living there. So right. that part of it, you're okay on. And his roommate the, would be the wife, right? Right. The question would be, well, no, no, because you're the, 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 the wife, the wife immediate is a family. family. The so wife is a family. The wife is now immediate family. family. But, but we don't know if it was a subsequent divorce. Of She's course, we have to copy the marriage license. There's, look, you, you could probably somebody could probably do some research and try okay. to figure that out. Um, that's I do I, know he bought in Broward County just in his name in 2013, which to me, I mean, it, it, it's not unheard of, but it's unusual if he was now married. That well, as I, I told you about the case that I had, husband owns the house, wife keeps the apartment in her name here. Right. She lives in the house though, right. but uh, having that, it's, it, it's a good, they set up their, their ducks in a row, that's called yeah. proper prior preparation, preventing poor performance. They would be thinking it the right way. I mean, I think somebody would have to look a little closely at the specific facts and, and really analyze it and decide if it was worth pursuing. Or not. But what we're, we are saying is that even if the wife came after the shareholder purchasing the unit, she is a lawful owner of the unit. Well, no, that's, owner, owner is different. Just because she got married, if they never changed the stock certificate, she's not necessarily an owner. But she, she could become an owner without your consent. She is, if they're still married, no consent is required. She can be an owner just like that. Right, so there's... there's Since she's not, is she allowed to have a roommate? Just like that. Since she's not, she's is she allowed to have a roommate? Since she's not, is she allowed to have a roommate? 
Uh, that's a good question. It's my belief that once she's married, she's a member of the immediate family. I, I think that she's entitled to get it, but... She's entitled to... Rule. Have a roommate, too. So she's not on the stock certificate. But she's a designated legal resident, right? Yes. yes. As a designated legal resident, she has the right to have a roommate. It, it, it may not be right on the line of everything, but it would be very, very, you know, it would be a difficult, it would be a difficult case. I don't know if somebody will get it. If time for one more, Mr. Sonny wants one more. I just want to just hold. Hold on, Charles, one second. Okay, so. There might be another dimension. If the primary res uh, tenant has moved, you know, primary owner or resident moves out, and the wife is there, there may be right of succession. Because they may be financially, well, and uh, they may be just a, yeah. it's a fact to consider that they may be right of succession as a defense. If you are trying to bring an action, you may face a defense that I have inherited it or I, I was financially or economically dependent. So that could be an issue that could be raised. Yes. This gentleman had a question. If you want to take one more, go ahead. Just quick, somebody mentioned using a camera by the What do you mean by that? What do you, what do you think? Are you subject to liability? Are you exposing herself for allegedly breaching their privacy? You don't put it that it looks into their apartment. You can do it in such a way that it shows enough of the hallway that you're protected. So if it's in an open area or a common area, Yes. No sound. Whoever your attorney is, get an opinion letter from him, please. So. No. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you all. It's 9 o'clock. Carl Finger, Finger and Finger, Ron Shear, Table Farm and Shear, Jack Malley, Smith, Buss, and Jacobs. Thank you. Watch for our events. You'll be getting emails. Please keep in mind our holiday party is a nice event, December 11th. Call us or email us for details. Thanks for coming. Have a great night.